Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by a returning guest, a uh, great friend of the podcast, our uh, senior economic advisor, uh, Mr. Edgardo Sepulveda, uh, regulatory economist, originally in telecommunications, but um, I feel like you're pretty solidly grounded in, uh, in energy now. Um, <laughs> I should hope so. It's been five or six years now. I was a little probably, given how much I know about telecoms, I was a little immodest at the beginning when we started doing this like a year ago. But I think yeah. now it's like, at least on an airy, on an honorary perspective, yeah, I'm an energy economist now. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll, actually be talking, we'll actually be talking about like who gets to be called what and who's going to tell me not to call myself something, right? So this is this is all I love it. this is all kind of like in context of our discussion today. Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Um, you know, and a few more of your uh, accolades um, on the energy sphere: um, ED uh, decarb, ED decarb, ED -carb, uh, yeah, like as in uh, elect uh, electro uh, yeah electrification decarbonization, yeah, edcarb.org. And we're gonna have we're gonna have you back um, for an episode shortly to talk about your uh, findings there. Um, this twenty plus countries uh, analysis of um, of their uh, attempts or successes at decarbonization. So we'll, we'll get into that on another upcoming episode soon. But um, I'm bringing you on, um, I guess, kind of urgently um, to discuss um, something of relevance to Canada, but also to the world. Um, this is the Canada Green Bond Framework. I'm I'm sort of thinking of it a little bit as our little. Uh, Canadian version of the EU green taxonomy. I'm going to check with you to see if that's um, valid or not. And of course, this has many reasons for being relevant to me, but it's a little bit personal um, because uh, this features one of the uh, great villains um, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, Canadian anti-nuclearism, uh, Mr. Stephen Gilbo, who I had the pleasure of a bit of an ambush interview with uh, in Glasgow uh, at COP26, where he told me um, as a way to avoid um, uh, having to, I guess, make a statement about whether his uh, anti-nuclear activist past was going to cloud his judgment as minister, um, he told me the government had no role deciding on the technology of the energy transition. The market would decide. LCOE would decide. Um, got a great episode on that uh, with Mark, of course. Um, but here we have it. We have the Canada Green Bond Framework, um, and it does take a very um, particular position on nuclear, um, which we're going to get to shortly. But I'm going to bring you in now, Edgardo, to uh, tell us a little bit about about this breaking news. It just, uh, I think, was released a couple of days ago. That's right. We're recording um, uh, Sunday, March 6th. Um, and I think this came out uh, either February 28th or, or March 1st. So it's, it's very recent. Um, and um, because I've been on the show before, I would kind of, in terms of the bigger picture, we're going to provide you with a bit of an update of what's going on and some of the sort of conceptual framework. But there's, two, uh, there's a, at least two episodes that I'd recommend Again, uh, um, previous episodes on the couple. One was with uh, Art Hyde, with Arthur Hyde, who did uh, an ESG um, episode. I think it might have been in in April, May of last year, uh, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, and that was super good. Uh, I've learned lots about that. And then I did one with you maybe two months ago, Chris, on on uh, on Bruce Power, right? Uh, on Bruce Power, the Green Bond. Yeah. So those are two kind of like background um, episodes. Um, so the nutshell is, is that um, in the context of um, the federal government borrowing, um, and again, for those of you who are outside of Canada, uh, we are a federal country. Uh, and so the you know government of Canada does their own borrowing. Uh, as other uh, national governments do to um, uh, finance their services. Um, and then we also have provincial uh, and municipal uh, borrowing uh, authorities. Um, but in the context of their most recent uh, fiscal plan, um, uh, the federal government had announced uh, about a year ago that they would be issuing their first uh, green bond. Right, and a green bond is um, a, a financial instrument, basically a loan, um, where the government um, uh, borrows money 
uh, from the private sector and the promises to pay them uh, interest rate uh, and the capital after X number of years. So they do this all the time. Um, and they had announced about a year ago that they would be issuing a green um, bond. It would be their first green bond, right? So a lot of uh, governments around the world uh, have issued sustainable bonds, social bonds, green bonds. There's a whole classification process about what is green, what is sustainable. We'll get into that. Um, right. But they had uh, signaled about a year ago that they were going to be doing this. Um, they had established a whole framework about how they would do this. Uh, they had uh, identified and established a series of private sector advisory bodies um, uh, to help them out in kind of uh, understanding what the sustainable finance framework was and how they could get into it. Um, they ignored all of that, by the way, which we'll talk about that as well. And so last last sure. week they issued a framework um, that um, uh, is the precursor to actually issuing a bond, right? And this framework right. Right. Uh, includes a taxonomy, right? And a taxonomy, um, uh, which goes back to the, the Greek, uh, taxis means kind of classification, Nomi means system. It's basically a classification of like um, types of um, types of. It's a way to use a system classification. So, for example, if you remember your biology taxonomy, you know, <laughs> you know, you've got you know right. uh, vegetable, uh, yeah. mineral, all that kind of stuff, right? It's just a way to classify things. Yeah. And so, sure. in the green. Um, this green bond framework, the uh, the federal government of Canada um, includes a taxonomy of things that are um, eligible to receive financing and things that are not eligible to receive financing. And so under the eligible yes. criteria, there's a bunch of stuff, um, renewable, wind, solar, energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And on the excluded right. part is, among other things, tobacco, fossil fuels, gambling. Gambling. <laughs> alcohol. And, alcohol. <laughs> and nuclear energy. Uh, <laughs> and nuclear energy. So, <laughs> so Tom has a, a, good, a good friend of mine had a funny tweet saying that um, we should, uh, you know, crack a few beers, uh, smoke a few darts, and take a gamble on uh, on financing <laughs> nuclear energy. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, all, all joking aside, I mean, I've, I've seen this before. Um, there was, uh, when I actually was, when I was interviewing Art Hyde I, 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 for that uh, ESG episode, um, you know, it had come across my table. Um, actually, I think it was Simon Holmes, a court, who was denouncing a green fund that was listing nuclear alongside a similar uh, list of deplorables. Um, I think that was an Australian fund that also lumped in, uh, you know, trafficking in endangered animal species, organs, uh, you know, just you name it. It's there, right? Pornography. <laughs> um, it was a little shocking, though. I mean, I feel like there's been a lot of water under the bridge, um, you know, over the last few years. Um, as you mentioned, the Bruce uh, Green Bond, I think it was for 500 million. I think they ended up raising seven times that amount. There's certainly a lot of interest in it. A lot of people that are are buying in uh, literally to uh, this understanding of nuclear as as green and critical for um, an energy transition towards decarbonization. Uh, the EU green taxonomy, as you mentioned, despite the uh, most powerful country in the EU um, with a fundamentalist aversion to nuclear, um, finally nuclear made its way into that framework. So that's it. You know, and that was after years, years yep. of of debate. And again, referencing old episodes, we had a great episode with Mirto Tripathi that really goes through that. Well, that's so exactly it. That's on. sorry, and that's the other one I should mm -hmm. have men uh, I've mentioned is is yeah. is that there's a whole history of that. And so, look, I mean, I I think I think you know, um, I, I think we should we should talk about the process, right? I think that's super important yeah. because, I mean, you know, one of the things about that. Um, is super important in terms of um, credibility, um, sustainability, uh, uh, is, is the process in which governments and government um, entities make decisions, right? That is one of the core issues that as a 
telecoms economists is is hyper important, right? If you're going to make mm -hmm. arbitrary, capricious decisions, right, that are not based in fact, that do not follow natural justice, procedurally correct processes, then regardless of the substantive decisions that you've made, your decision making process is is flawed, right? And so from yeah. a flawed process often comes flawed decision making, right? So there's one process, yeah. we'll, and, I'll, and I'll get to that. The other one is substantively, right? Uh, substantively, um, uh, this is not a science-based uh, decision. Uh, and so right. that's one of the other things. So, so both in the process and on the substance, this is an incorrect decision. Um, and it's surprising, as you say, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, maybe I'm going to try and take a stab at some of the reasons that, that I find it surprising, um, this framework and why, why nuclear wasn't included. So you, you mentioned there's a, a bunch of uh, feel-good um, eligible um, activities, um, you know, and this includes things like, um, you know, efforts that help biodiversity, conservation efforts, um, clean water efforts within the, um, the renewable power, um, you know, it's, it's pretty specific wind, solar, micro hydro, not large hydro, um, bioenergy. So biomass is in, um, and as long as the direct emissions are less than a hundred grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, again, the latest, uh, UN uh, Economic Commission uh, of Europe report says that nuclear is at four grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, so a full uh, one twentieth um, of of those emissions. Um, and just relevant to Canada, um, you know, I, I tend to talk about these things a lot, but um, you know, seventy six thousand. Like if we're thinking about ESG, right? We have the environmental side. You know, we have the richest uranium ores in the world. Our mining footprint is thus absolutely tiny. Um, you know, it's the largest employer of, of First Nations and an industrial employer of First Nations, um, you know, with this 96% made in Canada supply chain. But I, I was just doing a calculation on on the uranium side of things. Um, you know, nuclear energy offsets 2 billion uh, tons of CO2 per year. Um, I don't have the most recent numbers, but um, as of 2018, um, Canada supplied about 13% of uh, global uranium needs. And so that offsets uh, 260 megatons of CO2, which is one third of Canada's national emissions. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's... And we don't like, we're not used to thinking about, like, you're just, you're not allowed to think about nuclear in these terms. And I don't really like talking about carbon offsets too much. Right. But I mean, if we're going to go there, mm -hmm. it's pretty significant that we produce a natural resource that offsets one third of our country's national emissions. Um, you know, and to give you more context, I mean, our, our oil sands um, emit about 70 megatons of CO2 per year, and our uranium offsets 260 megatons of CO2 per year. So th those are a few reasons that I, I think nuclear should be, you know, pretty um, eligible. We could talk about the coal phase. I won't go on forever, but but we have a solid record yeah. in uh, in Canada and in Ontario of, of nuclear doing pretty incredible things for the environment, clean air. Um, and society in general. I'm going to get off my my uh, my hobby list there. And, <laughs> well, no, uh, <laughs> hey, listen, I mean, this is this is ultimately a dialogue, Chris. And so, 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 yeah, yeah. So, look, I mean, the the just in terms of just stepping back a bit, um, like you know, just a five minute little thing about about um, you know why you know. So one of the things about economics and i'm an economist I, I call myself an economist by the way uh chris and no one's going to stop me from calling myself an economist unlike you you're a medical doctor and if someone if i was to call myself a medical doctor i would have the law on my case because that is a regulated profession and right. licensed <clears throat> and so therefore the state via collective action considers it important to have a taxonomy of people who can call themselves doctors and those that cannot because it's a good thing to I mean, do. It, it, it does it does uh, i don't know what the, it does yank my chain a little bit that naturopaths get to call themselves hey, doctors but, but, but that's another, all that aside, <laughs> all that aside <laughs> what i'm saying is that we do that all the time right and and the sure. reason that we do that is because one of the things the way that that uh, markets and capitalism work supposedly well is through perfect information, right? So if I mm. can't tell who's a doctor and who isn't, right? Am I gonna make the right consumer decisions, right? If right. I, can I trust you or maybe not? 
And so I don't have to do my own research to trust you because I have the state and the licensing body saying, sure. you know, you're a doctor and I can trust you because you're qualified and you had to do X, Y, and Z, right? And, you know, yeah. um, and in this day of myths, information, disinformation, uh, propaganda, uh, think about the whole idea of vaccine is um, there is a marketplace of ideas. And one of the ways in which we're supposed to try to understand that is if, if the marketplace is not giving us the right uh, type of information where not all of us have the facility uh, and and time to be able to research your particular practice and understand whether or not you can be trusted as a doctor, we have uh, short forms of being able to do that. And the way we do that is through a licensing body, right? So let's take that to electricity and energy generally. Uh, for about 20 years, people have been calling themselves green, sustainable, ESG, mm -hmm. willy-nilly. Right. Willy-nilly. I'm green. You're an environmentalist. No, you're not an environmentalist. You're greenwashing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been uh, uh, people, and it's all unregulated, laissez-faire, right. Wild West, right? And so, Claim, claiming claiming a certain uh, degree of authority by by calling themselves like green economists, sustainable, right? Economists. Yeah, whatever. Is yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. Or calling okay. yourself an environmentalist. Like, there's no okay. There's no World Environmentalist Union that says only you can call yourself an environmentalist sure. or whatever, right? Anyone can call it. So you self-identify. You self-identify. Mm -hmm. You self. Uh, you self-describe as green. Right. So sure. okay. I, anyway, I'm making I'm, I'm kind of making joke with this, but it's no joke because there's billions of dollars to be made by calling yourself green right. in how you're labeled. Right. Sure. So there's billions of dollars to be made by the people who are in receipt of that capital. And there's billions of dollars to be made by the intermediaries, whether it's the bank or the financial institutions or the advisors or the people who designate you as green or not green, right? So, so in this free-for-all, and look, and, and there's some more reputable and less reputable. Um, in this free-for-all where, every, where, like, for example, like, I mean, and this is a long-standing issue. If we talk about doctors and the need to designate who is a doctor and who isn't, in capitalism and markets generally, this has long existed. That's why we have intellectual property rights. That's why you can't make, you can't call the sparkling wine that is made here in Niagara champagne. Champagne mm -hmm. is designated. There's a taxonomy. Champagne is made according to the Champenoise methodology in a specific geographic area in. France. You can't call champagne sure. that. So it's the same thing. What is green? What is champagne? What is a doctor? Who's an economist? Gotcha. Right? So in this free-for-all of information, disinformation, the EU decided that market sentiment was insufficient to be able to drive the diversion of, 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 mar of the capital necessary the trillions of dollars that are necessary to be able to designate what is actually green, right? So they set up, as we talked about, a, a process, uh, a scientifically based process that determined what was green and what was going to be mandatory. Because remember the other thing about all of these green labels, no one's forcing you to call yourself green or not green, right? It's all voluntary. It's all market-driven market sentiment. So then in the context, you have the EU who are putting out their taxonomy and who for electricity purposes have determined that, you know, not only are the renewables under certain conditions and certain kinds of hydro in certain conditions and gas in certain conditions and nuclear in certain conditions are sustainable, right? They never use the word green. It's all sustainable. Um, so in that context, um, the government of Canada about four or five years ago established uh, an external panel called the Panel on Sustainable Finance, 
right? Because Canada wanted to get into this. We have our own uh, net zero commitments. We have our own parish protocol commitments, et cetera. And so we wanted to do this, right, uh, as a country. Sure. Um, and we set out that panel. That panel did a recommendation. They said they asked for three things. They said, look, we don't have a taxonomy in Canada, right? So we're going to establish a taxonomy for Canada. That's going to be voluntary, right? And, and they, they gave that job to the Canadian Standards Association, right? So whenever... You know, you ever see the little thing about electricity and it has a Canadian standard, CSA? That's the Canadian Status Association, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, that job was given to them about two years ago, and it's like crash and burn. They cannot agree on a taxonomy, unsurprisingly, right? Because it's difficult, right? So to this day, the, the Transition Finance Taxonomy Working Group, after two years, has not issued a final result because it is blocked. They can't seem to reach a consensus. The Fed's also established a Canadian financial uh, group, uh, again, to advise them. They haven't issued anything. Um, and so the Fed's had uh, established all of these kind of like external advisory groups to advise them on how Canada as a whole and the government should be doing these kinds of what they call sustainable finances. None of them have published anything because it's really difficult. How long was the EU arguing about this? Three years, four years, right? And ultimately, as we know, in spite of the scientific consensus, the final decision was political, right? Yeah. It was yeah. a deal done between Merkel and Macron about whether or not what should be included and what shouldn't be included. Right, even though we right. have the scientific basis to be able to determine what is and what isn't sustainable. Right, and there was the and joint so research. And so it's in that context. That was tasked with looking at the science, but yeah. well, that's sort of tasked with looking at the science. So anyway, so fast forward, um, and the federal government in Canada, um, which has uh, about a trillion dollars worth of debt. Uh, it sounds like a lot. Um, GDP in Canada is two trillion, so it's about fifty percent GDP, fifty-five, sixty percent. It sounds like a lot, but um, in the grand scheme of things, by other OECD countries and G7 countries, is actually relatively low. Um, uh, is going to be, and this year in particular, is going to be issuing about half a trillion dollars. Uh, some of it is refinancing, some of it is new. So a portion of that, so one percent is going to be the green bond. So it's important to put this into perspective. Their commitment, this right. is the first green bond that the federal government issues. Um, and a green bond or a sustainability bond or whatever is basically says that the proceeds of the bond will be used for specific eligible uses, right? And so that's the taxonomy, right? But there's two problems. First of all, uh, the the advisory bodies that the government uh, established two or three years ago um, to advise them on how to do this have not issued any public process, any public report, any recommendation. Um, and second of all, this framework um, uh, was developed totally within and internal to the government. It was never actually consulted on uh, to us, to the public. And I've confirmed that. I've now confirmed that. And so you have basically this arbitrary, capricious uh, decision-making process without due to either expert or internal consultation. And the, the two main decision-makers, the two co-chairs of, of, I guess, the committee that, that put this framework together are... Uh, Christy Freeland, she's our deputy prime minister. Yeah, but she's uh, she's acting under. Yeah, she's 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 finance. yeah she's acting under. It's so it's a joint uh, ministry of finance because they do the money component of the federal yeah. government, and then and then uh, um, uh, Stephen Gubo, who under is the environmental minister, right? So it's a and joint environment and climate because there's money, and then there's the there's the money, and then there's the you know the sustainability aspect of it. Um, 
And so, so yeah. So- this this came as a bit of this came as a bit of a surprise for me, right? Because um, it was only in the French language press, but there was an article that came out about how uh, Gilbo's former environmental friends were, um, you know, incredibly upset with him for having finally said that yes, nuclear um, was going to be a part of the mix as long as it could uh, make itself uh cheaper than three cents per kilowatt hour uh, <laughs> so this was seen as as a huge betrayal um and my my impression was um you know that maybe the liberal government which has sort of got a bit of a schizophrenic relationship with nuclear um they have put um a certain amount of support into um you know technology technology development they've uh, given tens of millions of dollars to a couple of um uh, gen 4 um smr advanced nuclear companies um, and our previous minister of natural resources and climate change was quite bullish on nuclear. Um, so I, I thought maybe Stephen Gilbo was being disciplined and, and brought to account, but that's, that's why it was so shocking for me to see this guy. Here's this co-chair on this committee and nuclear's, uh, you know, basically pornography, gambling, tobacco, alcohol, firearms, uh, you know, lives in that company. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, look, I mean, look, there's, and then there, yeah, I mean, there's the political aspect. There's the inconsistency aspect of it right like and we talked we talked in our last episode chris about you know how for example uh, the federal this federal government uh, would not be able to use these green bond towards proceeds of some of their own um, equity stakes i mean they own the tmx pipeline uh, that's 100% right. owned by the federal government right they own yeah. the 10% of the Hibernia uh, oil fields, right? So, so you've got this schizophrenic kind of like uh, whereby, um, uh, you know, they are excluding certain uh, uh, types of activities through this green bond process without due process, uh, uh, without, um, and by the way, I mean, uh, Chris, I mean, the other thing that's surprising is that this is a 20-page document that summarily excludes nuclear energy literally without justification, right? Right. It, there's one, there's, one there's paragraph. One paragraph. There's no justification. One paragraph that explains it, and, it, and the justification is, I think I have it here in front of me, um, Basically, it's in recognition of the exclusionary criteria embedded in major green bond indices and green investor and market expectations. Uh, that, right. That's the and, rationale. And, it's, it's literally a sentence. Well, yeah. Right. And, but I mean, the rationale basically is, um, you know, market sentiment, we don't think that it may or may not be acceptable, Right. Right, so like that's the thing. But, so but Bruce, not... Bruce's green bond brought in seven times what it was asking for. So, so well, that's exactly that's it. And the EU accurate. taxonomy was just issued. Right. So it's as if this was thing. This was like issued last year. And, and and you know the thing is, I mean, they're the first. I mean, one of the things about the bond is that um, you know all the good stuff is always at the back of it, right? <laughs> because that's what the disclaimers are, right? Right. So. So if you read the disclaimer to the actual bond framework, it says, um, and I quote, there is currently no clear definition, legal, regulatory, or otherwise, or no clear market consensus as to what constitutes a green, sustainable, hmm. or equivalent labeled project, or as to what precise attributes are required for a particular project to be defined as green or sustainable or such other equivalent label. Uh, nor can any assurance be given that a clear definition or consensus will develop over time, nor if a definition or a, a consensus develops that it will not change over time. Accordingly, no assurance is given that the eligible green expenditures, which is what they've been defined in the body of the text, will satisfy any present or future investment criteria or guidelines with which an investor is required or intends to comply, in particular, blah 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 blah. Right. So, you know, it's like when you when you press. This is the disclaimer. Uh, this is the disclaimer, and the disclaimer basically right. says, um, you know, what we're saying is it's our opinion, right? Um, they base it on the uh, the International Capital Market Association (ICMA), uh, the Green Bond Principles which is one of dozens of these groups, intermediary groups, 
who are having their own taxonomies or principles. And they themselves say that they're not a taxonomy. Like the, the, the list of indicative types of projects that are listed in this green uh, bond principles are not exclusive. Um, they're indicative. Uh, and they uh, suggest that uh, investors um, you know, take into consideration national or regional taxonomies. So uh, the problem, so th th this is a fundamentally uh, 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 political take, um, and it's disappointing because it's not science-based. Um, it kind of talks about, you know, what is acceptable or what they consider may be acceptable um, in the market uh, without actually basing it on science, without actually having studied, and without actually having sought, uh, uh, at least publicly, external opinion. So it's disappointing both from a substantive and a procedural perspective. And what's what's your feeling on this? I mean, is this are they presenting this fait accompli? Like this is it? Here it is. Uh, suck it up. Or is this going to be the beginning of a process? Um, I mean, I gotta you know um, I guess reveal my hat here. Also, you know, I'm the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. We're we're planning on um, going to going to bat on this one. Um, going to try and hold the minister accountable and see if if we can get this reversed and engage Canadian society in a discussion about this uh, this issue. Um, but is, is your sense that this is sort of, they, they assume this is kind of the final thing, we, no more work for them to do, or, or was this launched as sort of a shot in the dark and, okay, let's have a discussion now? Well, uh, well, put it this way, formally, it was not a consultation. It's not a discussion document. Um, I expect this the first, well, I mean, this is it for now, right? I mean, uh, right. Uh, they themselves, as 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 I just read the disclaimer, they themselves recognize that that you know this is not um, there is no universal uh, uh, accepted taxonomy in Canada or anywhere else as to what constitutes sustainable and what isn't. Um, it is highly contested ground. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, if you're going to base this on opinion is one perspective, that is to say, what is market sentiment, uh, sentiment or how you interpret market sentiment, obviously Bruce Power, who just did a 500 million, so half a billion dollar green bond that was, that had a, 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 a second um, a second external opinion. I mean, this also had a second opinion by a different, different uh, intermediary, uh, um, you know, standards organization. Um, um, you know, whether or not uh, this is a uh, so. What I see that, like, what I see the risk and the danger and the folly in this is that. Uh, we will soon see the actual bond, right? So there's going to be a bond, right. I expect, within three or four uh, months. Um, and there's going to be a bond, and it's going to be picked up, uh, and it's going to be a green bond. It'll be Canada's first green bond. France, Germany, Hong Kong, China has issued many, many green bonds. So from that perspective, Canada is right. is is behind on that. Late and you know, yeah. And then the corporate bonds have been issued way before that, right? Like Bruce, right. Brookfield. I mean, there's been a bunch of other green bonds. Um, but they indicate that um, the federal government indicates that this is the first, that the next upcoming bond will be the first of many, right? So so this is the, this is the yeah. danger. Yeah, so this is a the five billion dollar uh, initial right. green bond. Yeah, and, I, I, and think, again, I think I think I saw them say somewhere in the report that you know they anticipated that you know that's been estimated the green transition was going to cost many trillions of dollars, and that ultimately Canada would probably need to spend something like two trillion dollars to kind of meet all of its climate goals. So this this is the the, the beginning of of quite a large expenditure to come. Um, can I tell you what I would do with five billion dollars? Uh, um, go for it. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> way, to, way to set you up for asking me the question I want to answer here. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've talked about this before. You were on Emmett Penny's Nuclear Barbarian talking about Pickering. Um, you know, $5 billion would, would uh, fund half of the refurbishment of Pickering. Um, Pickering going offline is going to erase one third of Canada's um, emission reductions to date since peaking in 2007. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to lose one third of our progress, probably all of our progress since signing the uh, Paris uh, Accords. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, we're going to raise national emissions by 1% by closing one nuclear plant. Um, so there's there's a you know a big opportunity here. Um, and when I look at you know the other stuff that's listed, it's pretty wishy washy. I mean, it, it's stuff that sort of feels good and sounds nice. Um, and there's gonna probably gonna be some like wetlands protection. Um, you know what else do we have here? Pl- planting some trees. Uh, you know, um, and helping homeowners install some nicer windows. I mean, this is stuff that's nice. It's it's kind of frilly, but like. If we wanted to take a real science based approach, I think it would be interesting. Like we've talked before about carbon abatement cost um, being the the tool that should really drive our our decarbonization decisions, right? How can we most rapidly, you know, and for the least expense, um, for biggest bang for our buck, decarbonize? It would be really interesting to do a sort of carbon abatement cost analysis, or at least have that guide us in terms of like if we were to have a science based green taxonomy, that's the approach I think we should take, not just arbitrarily picking a bunch of things that kind of feel nice and align with current, you know, environment of identity politics or whatever else. Yeah, I mean, and that's what, I mean, look, I mean, in that free-for-all wild west of everyone calling themselves green, sustainable, whatever, um, and, you know, I mean, it, and it's obviously there are people who are, you know, who we would all consider that the uh, green projects, and, you know, they don't get sort of the financial credit, because one of the things that has happened is that people have done the, the, the studies, and, uh, you know, people have studied at least on the secondary market and and also in terms of the amount of subscription or over subscription the difference between uh, let's call them non green bonds right what in the field is often referred to as vanilla bonds right versus green bonds yeah. right and and so people yeah. have, people have recognized at least in the secondary market there is what they call a greenium right which is a combination of premium and green which is that that there are uh, financial incentives to be identified as green right so the same way that you know before this uh, ip of champagne was there was a financial incentive for niagara on the lake sparkling wine to call themselves champagne because you 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 coat you you know you and so what you're trying to do with a taxonomy is trying to based on science is to try to stop that greenwashing right where everyone wants to call right, themselves green right. right so it's a taxonomy and and well, and hopefully and hopefully spend your money as wisely as possible right, right and that's exactly, why again, exactly, I think using right. something objective like carbon abatement cost is the way to go here i mean one one of the things they want to fund is um, you know, um, zero emission vehicles, that's very noble, but for them to be zero emission, they need to be powered by, you know, zero emissions electricity. And we're making no progress there. We're actually shutting down a massive electricity plant. We're shutting our clean electricity cathedral, as Emmett Penny would call it. We're shutting down Pickering. We're recarbonizing Ontario's grid. And, um, you know, uh, zero electric vehicles are supposed to be the only things that we're able to buy as of 2035. So I, I talk about this all the time, but it's like, you know, we're we're driving at 120 kilometers an hour towards a brick wall of promises, um, and there's uh, there's no brakes on the car. There's no we're we're not electrification 2.0 is not going on. That's we're right. Not, we're not adding to the grid. Yeah, yeah. And so it'll be interesting to see what they actually come up with, and you know whether it's science based or not, or whether you know it's fundamentally a a a you know a policy decision that's not founded on on science um or those kinds of metrics that we talk about like the carbon abatement costs um but yeah i mean to go back to your original question chris i mean a this is a um you know this is not law the first thing like this is a ministerial decision right and so it's not it wasn't debated in parliament right it did not receive, uh, uh, it wasn't approved or debated or reviewed by any of the parliamentary commissions um, or uh, committees, sorry. It certainly was not um, uh, consulted with the public 
nor was there is there any demonstrated um, uh, evidence that any of the three or four consultative external bodies, expert bodies, like the people that would actually be able to, for instance, like that joint uh, research committee, the JRC, that did the study on that nuclear ha- does not do any significant harm and actually does less significant harm than like wind and solar. That expert right. body, public document advising the politicians, there's no evidence that actually any of that actually took place in Canada. Right? And so it's right. arbitrary, it's capricious, it's unfounded. Right. Um, But all to say, it's not law. And so it can be changed. It can be changed by a minister, a different minister or a different government. And and I mean, to bring things full circle again, my question for Stephen Gilbo at COP was literally, you know, will your anti-nuclear activist commitments cloud your judgment as the minister of environment and climate change? Will it impact your decision making? Will it will, will those prejudices, despite the IPCC scientific consensus that we need to dramatically increase our nuclear fleets around the world. You know, will that cloud you? And I mean, it clearly has. And it, um, uh, it's going to be very interesting to figure out what the inner workings of, of government are here. If he'll get his wrist slapped on this, I think it's going to depend tremendously on on people's reaction. Um, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see. I guess what what happens over the next couple of months. But uh, there's an urgency here because that five billion you said is going to be issued. You're thinking within within. Probably before summer. Yeah, yeah. I, I expect it to be the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the traditional process is you put out a framework, you get the framework, uh, you have an external review framework, uh, and that's that was issued. Yeah. And then soon thereafter, you go to market. Uh, they've already identified the, the financial runners. It's TD Bank and the HSBC Holdings who are going to be doing this, who are going to be placing the bonds with institutional investors. Right. I expect, right. like anything else that's green, uh, self-described green, not scientifically based green, um, sure. is going to be um, oversubscribed in the same way that the Bruce Green Bond was oversubscribed. Um, and if it's successful, um, you know, I expect subsequent uh you know government of 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 canada bond issues to go this way again it's still small we're and, talking about one yeah. percent of of borrowing for this year yeah and, and just to clarify again um you know under a bond framework the government has no obligation to invest this money in a way that's going to generate the kind of profits to actually pay this off right they, they, there's no link between how they spend this money no, and no no so, and the outcome so this could just be a you know a, a, an expensive way to rack a bunch of debt on measures that are not yeah. really that impactful so so for climate. So, um, so you know as far as the green the sustainable finance has advanced it um sort of sustainable finance has advanced around the world in the eu etc uh there there's a bunch of differences first of all um one of the things that you're supposed to do is that it, you're supposed to be transparent in terms of the proceeds, right? So, so instead of just like, for instance, you know, um, if you're fortunate enough to own a house, you, when you take a mortgage, you're supposed to use it. It's earmarked for the house. It's not a generic loan. If you take out a loan for a car, it's earmarked for the car. So a green bond is, is supposed to be earmarked for eligible expenditures. Right, so that's one difference. So in before, nothing stopped the federal government from using some of its general revenues to, for example, providing credit or guarantees to uh, small modular reactor firms. Right, and we've we've done that. They didn't have to have a green bond for that. They didn't have to have a green bond for the financing of of wind turbines or whatever. Right, they didn't have to have a green bond for you know, purchasing TMX. They just took it out of their general revenues. The difference between green bonds, um, among right. other things, is that it's supposed to be earmarked. But there's, it's not as if you're using those investments in terms of collateral, right, or security. Nothing like that. It's basically, it hasn't got to do with returns. It's just expenditure driven, right? Nor, right. importantly, is there any requirement that this is additional to what they were otherwise going to do, right? So the feds could have just done this regularly. There's no indication, and ultimately money is fungible, 
there's no reason to think that they would have not done this anyway, right? Made the made the made the uh, the, the spent the right. money. Right. Um, so what this is, it, the green bond yeah. is all about signaling. It's all about self-identification right. of being green and self-identifying in green, and what you know what people often negative say is virtue signaling. Okay, Gerdo, just just on this point of using government-backed bonds to fund nuclear builds, because this is really exciting to me. Um, you know, Hinkley Point, um, I've heard interest rates were 9, 10, 11%. Um, and that that why why is that that so expensive? Was it was it just privately funded? Um, was it was it a bond? What what's the, what's the difference here? So one of the ways in which um, tra- we were able in the West to have the electricity system that we've had for the last hundred years is that most of it was done by public entities. Uh, so state-owned enterprises, um, you know, and in Canada it would be the Ontario Hydros of the world, the the Hydro Quebecs of the world, and the way that that was actually done, how was it financed? Was that these companies, uh, because they're public companies, would issue bonds, right? So they would issue bonds to borrow the money from the public, but usually from institutional investors, and they would. Um, those, issue those bonds, basically issue uh, uh, bonds to uh, borrow money. Um, and one of the ways that they were able to do this efficiently and effectively was because either implicitly or explicitly, those bonds were guaranteed by the corresponding government. So if I'm a Joe Blow, uh, and I want to go borrow $10 billion from the bank, they're going to say, uh, well, how are you going to pay it back? What's your credit rating? Do you have a guarantee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? What are you building? Is that going to be able to uh, generate revenues for you to pay me back? They would laugh me out the bank, rightfully so. Um, when you do that as a private company, um, you know, uh, your guarantee is that you could go bankrupt right? Um, that, uh, and a whole series of other things, you know, that, you know, you, you may not get the permission to do the project that you're looking for. And so you're borrowing at, you know, depending on the year, you're borrowing at five, six, seven, eight, nine percent a year. And so therefore, it's much more costly. And so your break even has to be shorter and you're less inclined to make really long-term investments, like 20, 30, 40, 50 years, because you're never going to have the, the guarantee to be able to actually pay that back. But that's not the way it actually worked. That's not the way we built our grid here in Canada, the way they built the grid in France, or the way they built the grid in the UK. The way they built the grid there was either through public entities where, uh, you know, like, uh, 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 like Ontario Hydro said, Look, I'm a, uh, I'm a public company, and I'm going to go to the capital markets and borrow money, and I'm going to borrow $10 billion. Uh, and so the, the, the banks and the, the lending public would say, well, okay, you're pretty good. You've got a lot of revenues. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get paid back. Uh, so I'm going to give you like a, a lower interest rate. Because remember, interest is a reflection of the risk of not being paid back. And so I'm going to give you a lower interest rate than like some private company. But I'm going to even give you a lower interest rate. Why? Because I know that the province of Ontario will always pay me back. They will either legally or implicitly pay me back. And so in that instance, I'm going to give you 2%. Right. Right. And so then and it becomes have, have super to, yeah. cheap. Right, and that's the difference between H- H- mm-hmm. Hinkley Point. Two, thir- two thirds of Hinkley Point is interest payments to to uh, the, the bond buyers. And I understand in that situation, EDF put up a bond, and, and unfortunately couldn't get um, you know an interest rate better than nine or ten percent. The financing wasn't yeah. And so one of the things they did is in order to do that is in in uh, in um, in uh, in the next round, they went to what is called the uh, rev- uh, the um, regulated asset base model, which was basically uh, is 
guarantees, like we do in Canada with rate of return and what is done in the United States and Canada for literally 80 years for federal for private companies, which is this, which is the state saying, look, because uh, wholesale uh, markets are so uh, uncertain and and are so um, variable, where it's very difficult to guarantee a revenue flow that is uh, in the long term, we're going to guarantee you a rate of return. We're going to guarantee you certain revenues. And that s- revenue stream allows you to de-risk your investment. And by de-risking the investment, that basically means you're able to access the capital markets at a lower rate compared to a risked investment, right? So, so these are the things that we... Ha- learned how to do for 80 years in North America and in parts of Western Europe, we learned to, if we're not going to do this publicly through a publicly guaranteed bonds, we're going to de-risk private investment to be able that they can actually borrow for cheaper, which is ultimately good because that means that we as consumers get lower prices. This is this is just blowing my mind, Edgardo. It's blowing my mind. Um, it's all of a sudden making making a nuclear renaissance seem seem doable. Honestly, I mean, if if governments can can get the political consensus, if the if we can shift the culture towards um, really appreciating what nuclear has to offer us, particularly in terms of this time of war, in terms of energy security, a, a true way to to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. Um, there's a huge amount of money around, um, floating around the world. This this giant pool of investor money looking for a place to put itself in, in a green investment, well, for, get a guaranteed sure. return. And the government, the government can guarantee it. AAA rated governments can can offer That's right. bonds um, at two percent interest. That's that's a game changer to me. I hadn't, yeah, I'd never yeah, heard of like, that. Yeah, look, there's there's it. you know like last year, uh, total investment in generation was was uh, across the world was i think uh uh 400 billion dollars right um and 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 so there's a, a you know that's a you know and that's just maintenance and also for new generation there's a huge amount of money um uh there's a lot of money to be made and there's a lot of intermediaries and there's a lot of greenwashing and a lot of opinion based classifications and taxonomies and then there's science and facts and and our our challenge is to uh, make sure that we stay on the science, and that we once we recognize the science, is that we facilitate uh, both public investment by like what you're saying now, Chris, which is you you politically try to persuade governments to make the kind of necessary investment and to guarantee that investment being made by those public entities, or you de-risk the process by providing financial mechanisms that essentially lower the price of, bor- of borrowing. Okay, just just because I think we should wrap up because this has been dense um, and I don't want to go on too long, but I just wanted to, you know, people talk about, you know, the need for a sort of wartime, I mean, war is not hot at all right now, but, a, you know, war t- World War II level mobilization, a wartime type mobilization to combat climate change. A lot of, you know, I've certainly seen the propaganda posters for buy your war bonds. I'm just trying to get a sense of like, you know, in terms of funding climate action um, and making that comparison to funding the war effort, how significant were bonds, um, say, in World War II and, you know, off the cuff? Uh, I no, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Look, I mean, and I don't know whether those bonds were truly dedicated to buy munitions. Right, whether if you knew right. that if you bought a bond, you would buy a bullet, or if you bought a tank, or you bought a whatever, I think it was um, right. my sense of the situation was was that um, it was just general government expenditures, right, and and the government needed a lot. Look, we're just coming out from a huge expenditure by the federal government in the context of COVID nineteen, right? Like right. literally, right. they doubled their expenditures, and the debt level went very much higher because they borrowed, you know, without actually increasing taxes. So um, the the $5 billion that is going towards this green bond, again, uh, this year, the government will be uh, going to the market to borrow $500 billion. So this is 1%, right? So it's not a large amount, but it is important in terms of signaling 
where they want to do, what they want to do, what they consider to be sustainable, and what is not sustainable. And it's non sustainable. And in non sustainable is fossil fuels, alcohol, right? Armaments. <laughs> As if the government was going to spend a bunch of money on gambling, um, smokes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and drinks. Well, that's I mean, a, perhaps that's, that's a virtue what they signaling parties, part of but, it, right? Yeah. Like that. I yeah, am. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. No, like it's, it's... you, you signal your virtue signal by two things: by what you consider to be virtuous <laughs> and sustainable, and what you consider yeah. not to be, right? But this is literally the government saying, "We, the government, promise we're not going to spend this five billion dollars, you know, racking up gambling debts, smoking darts, <laughs> uh, drinking brewskis, and uh, you know, manufacturing weapons." I mean, it's it's really comical when you look at it. And you know, you're saying like, you know, this is fungible. You know, who knows what they'll spend money on? They could have done another way. But I mean, this is an opportunity. This is a way to raise five billion dollars and refurbish Pickering, and you know, prevent Canada losing a third of its. Um, you know, emissions reductions. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And we, you'd have to, yeah, we'd have to like, discuss like, the, the whole let's thing. Let's not poo-poo this. This, this is significant. Yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. You no, know, I, I, what I wanted to do make, is make, that I just wanted to make yeah. sure that I put the context in terms of this is right. a, a this gotcha. is a large five billion sounds like a lot of money, but it is like one yeah. percent of the the gross borrowing that the government will do this year. Um, yeah, and and by to to make that sort of war bond analogy again, I mean by by kneecapping and saying nuclear can't be a part of this, I kind of feel like it's a war bond. You were saying like these war bonds, you didn't think they were, you know, it's going to buy X amount of munitions, but it's it's kind of the equivalent of buying a war bond and saying, you know, you can it's only going to be uh, we're only going to use bows and arrows in in the second well, world yeah. war. Well, yeah, well, 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 the other thing <laughs> is, I mean, I mean? It, it's 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 you know, it's something that we should we should um, uh, you know that I personally will be wanting to try to change for, for a bunch of reasons, right? So the, the first thing is, is that in the same way that the EU taxonomy was so important because it is science-based and it is mandatory, right? So this is the other thing, like the EU taxonomy is mandatory. So like, like Germany, France, you know, whatever, Portugal, any other EU country um, does not have a choice to go to an external market-based, sentiment-based uh, methodology or framework to call something green or to call something sustainable, right? So, so in that respect, it, it's kind of like the, the whole champagne, right? It, it is regulated, right? It's not a free market unregulated process. This thing right now for Canada is 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 voluntary like no one forced canada to do this they think it's 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 you know it's appropriate it's good to get into the sustainable finance market but it, it does two things first of all it starts to influence what is happening at the provincial level right because it creates if the possibility that bruce power wants to go get and access the capital markets through a green bond that Canada, the federal government, last week designated nuclear energy as not sustainable would make it harder for private companies right. like Bruce to go into the market, even though they had just done it last year, right? It also makes right. it harder right. for the provincial governments where energy and electricity are managed. So the, the provincial government in Ontario, uh, our province, uh, went out and got a green bond about uh, seven years ago. They're one of the first governments in, in North America to do so. It makes it harder. It doesn't make it impossible because none of these are, are mandatory. It makes it harder for you know the provinces then to get sustainable financing for, among other things, for nuclear energy. So it makes it harder for... That's a precedent. Yeah. It makes it harder for the the provinces and it makes it harder for the private sector, right? It also, what it also does is that it influences the decision-making process and recommendations by these supposedly uh, external advisor groups that are actually putting together the Canadian taxonomy, right? Like right. the CSA has been arguing for, you know, with these working groups for two years, and they can't come to a consensus on it, right? And right. so, again, when the federal government says, look, this is in, this is out, that's going to be influencing, uh, it's right. hard to believe they won't influence, what is happening at the advisory committee level. Okay, I got one last question for you, Gerdo. Um, just thinking about 
bonds as a, as a financial tool to, to make some climate action happen. We know that uh, nuclear plants are, are, are hard to fund. Um, discount rates are high. Interest rates are high. Um, could a bond be issued for, you know, $5, $10 billion to, to fund a nuclear plant? Um, you know, paying like it's guaranteed. You know, people buy into the bond, the government's backing it. They're guaranteeing we're going to pay you back that money in 20 years plus 2% interest per year. I mean, wouldn't that be a way to get around these usurious interest rates? I mean, it would, it would involve the government taking on the risk. But at a time of historically low interest rates, that is a potential mechanism for government to get a bunch of nuclear plants built. If, if we were living in times, um, you know, where we took electrification 2.0 yeah, seriously. Yeah, oh, for sure. We were, we were I mean, and about, that's the way it was. You know, building that electrical grid to... Right. to, to yeah. Power those yeah, cars. Those exactly. Like and traditionally, that's the way it's been done. So, for example, when, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way that Bruce Power, which is a private sector enterprise, issued a bond to help it finance its refurbishment, um, you know, a, you know, a, uh, like a, like a, like a, like a provincial uh, electricity company, whether it's, um, you know, uh, BC Hydro, Quebec Hydro, Quebec Hydro issues millions and billions of bonds on, a, on an annual basis uh, to finance uh, its infrastructure. Um, and it's all guaranteed by the, by the, by the, you know, by the federal, by the provincial government. And so, yes, that's the way that's exactly it's being that's done. True. And, you know, before sustainable financing was a thing, they were issued by, you know, by, uh, by, you know, OPG, OPG does it as well, or the old Ontario Hydro. Ontario Hydro had uh, billions of loans out there to finance, among other things, you know, its its dams, its uh, its you know nuclear build out, right. et cetera. So yeah, it exists. It's the way it's traditionally been done, um, and to this day, I assure you that you know OPG and uh, BC Hydro, Manitoba Hydro, BC Hydro. Uh, uh, is is managing billions of debt that are being paid off by you know ratepayer uh, charges, and that's the way that you do it, and you guarantee just, it by it the like you an, guarantee it yeah. by the state. <clears throat> it seems like an elegant way to uh, to build the mega projects we're going to require. That's exactly to, the way uh, it is. Mitigate and adapt to climate yeah, change. That's yeah. exactly okay. it, and you just call it green, and you have a sustainable, and you get a third party or a second party opinion to do it. Um, and you're good to go. You go out to the capital markets again. Bruce just did it. They like were a, raised yeah. half a billion dollars, um, and it was successful. And they're likely to do it again. Yeah, I mean, from what I heard, they they had interest for seven times that amount, three point five billion. Yeah, it's not unusual was. to be yeah. the the technical terms oversubscribed. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, we know what's possible. We've identified here on Decouple. You know the the mechanism to uh, to fund the nuclear renaissance. Let's get her done. Um, <laughs> I always feel like I, I kind of editorialize so much uh, on episodes of the Odd I don't know what it is. Well, uh, um, I mean, I'd, I'd ask. And and no, I mean, look, I mean, I, I um, <laughs> it's a it's a good um, it's a good team because I you know I um, uh, you know I'm I'm trying to provide um, uh, between signal and noise. I'm trying to provide a bit more signal, uh, more of the fact, and then I'm happy for you to uh, conclude the sentence, provide the punchline. Love it. All right. Thank you for your generosity, Edgardo. Um, folks, uh, please do remember to like, subscribe, and review us. It does a lot for the podcast. Also, please go over to our YouTube channel. We're planning a major expansion on YouTube. Jesse's uh, going to be really upping his output with the couple studios. Um, support us on Patreon. And last of all, um, I feel like I've been such a douche uh, for 100 and something odd episodes, well, at least since Dylan's been helping. A big uh, thanks to Dylan Moon, uh, the excellent producer of Decouple. Um, you'll probably notice, I think, from about episode 60 onwards, the sound quality got remarkably better. The editing is fine. Um, so thank you, Dylan, for everything that you do as well. Um, that's it for this week, folks. Um, looking forward to... Uh, Another great episode next week. Edgardo, we'll have you back soon to talk about electric electrification 2.0. Yeah, for sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to put a lot of this background information that I've, uh, that I've talked about in the show notes, as, as, as well as my Twitter handle. Okay. Thanks again, Edgardo. Bye for now. Bye, Chris.